Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to At the Heart of the Work, a celebration of the electronic digital computer at Carnegie Mellon University, an unveiling of the plaque to commemorate the location of CMU's first electronic digital computer, and a celebration of the legacy at the computer on campus. My name is Andrew Mead McGee. I hold an appointment as a visiting assistant professor in the history department, and I am in the university libraries, the clear postdoctoral fellow in the history of science and computing. I'm part of an initiative based in Hunt Library to promote the study of the history of science, technology, and computing at CMU, to bring together groups across campus already doing work in these areas, and to promote new research initiatives, exhibitions, public events, and collections around topics of science, technology, and computing history. Today, we have an exciting series of speakers leading up to an unveiling of the plaque. I wanted to go over just a, a few logistics points. First, we will have a remarks by the Dean of the Libraries, Keith Webster, and the University President, Farnham Jahanian. Then Professors James Morris and Lenore Bloom will speak. Then we'll have a reception which you can wander around, look at the exhibits in the case. There is a program that lays out what items and photographs are on display. We have photographs drawn from the university archives and collection items taken from the Posner Collection, the Traub McCordick Collection, and several other holdings of the Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. On the inside cover of your program, you'll find a solicitation to submit us your memories of computing at CMU, whether you're an alum, student, faculty member, staff, or just a member of the community. Tell us your memories of how you've used computers. We're soliciting this information as we're starting an oral history initiative and trying to learn where the community would be interested in following some of these narratives of the history of computing. The event today is sponsored both by the university libraries and by a new organization on campus, HOST at CMU, which stands for Histories of Science and Technology, a cross-campus initiative based in Hunt Library, but drawing on faculty and staff from across campus who are interested in promoting history of science and technology more broadly, history of computing, and institutional histories within Carnegie Mellon University. We have some wonderful items on display today. We have photographs from across the range of CMU's history. We have a robot on loan from the Robotics Institute. We have some of Herb Simon's logic toys. And we have some wonderful early computing pieces loaned to us by two good friends of the program, Mary Shaw and Catherine Kapitas from the School of Computer Science. And now, I'd like to introduce our sponsor for today, the man who is hosting the event and who has made possible the new initiative in the history of science, technology, and computing, the Dean of the Libraries, Keith Webster. Thank you, Andrew. Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to see you on campus today. I will give apologies in advance. If we're still going at 3.15, I will be making a sharp exit. Some of you know that there is this bizarre festival during Carnival which involves deans being drenched in water, and it's my turn to be drenched at 3.30, and I'm not going to wear this when I'm getting soaked. So I will be making a sharp exit. Uh, I noticed in the, um, you know, the, the notes that I was given for this event that Farnham has been asked to say a couple of words about his first computer, and that prompted me to think about my first experience with computing, which was in the mid to late 70s when my high school in the northeast of Scotland every year would receive delivery of a computer from Aberdeen University. It would come for a week. It would come in a large truck. They would take two days to unbox it, install it in a classroom which had been emptied for the purpose. We would have one day of putting in our punch cards and then two days to dismantle the, the machine. And I thought it was just so exciting that we could spend weeks in advance writing code, we didn't call it code in those days, on paper, and then transcribe it into punch cards, and then you would drop them and wish you'd really pursued the random number option rather than the structure of cards. And then you'd get the printout a week later telling you that 2 plus, plus 3 equals 5. It was just so fantastic. But it changed the course of my career. When I was a computer science student in the mid-'80s, I was given a copy of a book called The Fifth Generation, coincidentally written by Ed Feigenbaum and Pamela McCorduck. That changed the course of my career by really making me think about the interaction between computer science and library science, which happened to be big at my university. 
and really focused on whether artificial intelligence could change how we interact with content. It only took 35 years, but last week, um, Springer published the first comprehensive book written by a machine learning algorithm. They had digested thousands of scholarly articles in a branch of chemistry and written a literature review running to several hundred pages completely without human intervention. That was what I hoped I would do when I read The Fifth Generation. Uh, but the interesting segue there is the relationship with Pamela McCardock, who I met two or three years ago. Many of you know Pamela. She and her late husband, Joe Traub, were influential figures on this campus in the 1970s. Part of that interaction with Pamela led to the gift of the Traub McCardock collection of pre-digital computers, which in turn brought Andrew, who just welcomed you, to our campus as a postdoc fellow to work with that collection. Separately, Pamela has been working on an autobiographical history of artificial intelligence. It will be published later this year, but you have in your hands today, or you might be sitting on it, um, a copy of the first three chapters of the book, which are not terribly salacious, but they are, they are very entertaining reminiscences of her relationships with Simon and Newell and Reddy. And you will have great fun reading this. Uh, computation occurred frequently on the campus of this institution before the first computer arrived in 1956, but it was plotted out by slide rules and mechanical tabulators. On the 28th of August 1956, we entered the digital age thanks to a partnership between the then GSIA, now the Tepper School of Business, and the departments of electrical engineering, psychology, and mathematics. And that sort of collaboration speaks very much to the culture of this institution then and now, the collaboration across disciplines. And I'm not going to steal Jim Morris's thunder and say more about the history of that. What I will say, in case he doesn't, is that that first computer, the 650 from IBM, was valued by the company at the time at $250,000 and with annual operating costs of $53,000. In today's terms, a purchase price of $2.3 million. You can get a lot of scholarly journals for that. And $490,000 in annual running costs. I do believe that we in libraries and we as a university community have a responsibility both to preserve and to celebrate the history of this remarkable institution and to the history of the disciplines for which we are renowned around the world. I'm so grateful for the support of donors like Pamela who make our work in this area possible. I'd be happy to talk to any of you who would be interested in helping us curate the history of computing at CMU. I'm also incredibly appreciative of the strong support and endorsement for our work of our president, Farnam Jahanian, who I now invite to address you. Well, good afternoon. It's so good to be with you uh, this afternoon. And uh, before I start, I just want to remind you this is such a special weekend on our campus as we celebrate the Spring Carnival, which of course is one of the longest tra traditions we've had on this, uh, at this institution. This is the 105th anniversary of our carnival, I should say, uh, uh, here. Um, I saw some data that I want to share with you. We have 2,500 alumni and parents who pre-registered for this event, which is twice the number that we had last year. Uh, the mayhem that you see outside includes uh, uh, about 100 events across various venues on campus. Um, we have reunions of 1st, 5th, 10th, 25th, and 50th uh, alumni reunion. Uh, anybody in the 50th year today? Oh, gosh, all right. Well, not... Do I hear 60? No, no, this could become an auction. Uh, welcome back. Can you introduce yourself? I... Fabulous. Welcome back. Welcome back. Happy to have you back on campus. 
And I should also tell you that uh, we have nine buggy races. Two of them are autonomous. So uh, uh, you would expect that at CMU, and of course that makes our general counsel really nervous. Uh, <laughs> Uh, once again, it's so good to be with you. Thank you, Keith, for hosting this um, historic celebration. I want to begin by acknowledging Dean Keith Webster for his outstanding leadership of our university library. Uh, thank you, Keith, for everything that you do. I also want to welcome, extend a warm welcome to all of you. It's such a pleasure to see so many of our alum, colleagues, of course, faculty, staff, and students, and parents. I want to acknowledge uh, our university trustees who are with us today, Anne Malloy and Marianne Olishny are with us today. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> also, uh, <clears throat> we have a number of, of course, uh, speakers and a number of my colleagues from computer science who've played such a significant role in shaping this institution, including, of course, uh, Jim Morris, Lenore Bloom, and I saw Mary Shaw earlier today, and there she is. Mary is right here. Well, thank you all for joining us. I'm also joined by a number of uh, my colleagues from the university leadership. Our provost, Jim Garrett, was here. He just got wet outside. <laughs> Not uh, because of uh, the rain. He was the first one who participated in Douse the Dean, uh, which is a special Olympics uh, fundraising that our police department does, and as Keith mentioned, he's going to be there after 3.15. We'll try to finish by 3.30 so we can come and contribute to this uh, dousing ourselves, and I know Amy Burkert and a number of my other colleagues are here today. Um, I also want to acknowledge the student groups that are showcasing some really cool demos of our early computing technology. Professor Daniel Cordoso, uh, Iac, I think, is here from the School of Architecture and the students from his Computational Design Laboratory uh, who are demoing a pioneering piece of software used in urban design. Also, Students Computer Club, uh, an officially recognized student chapter of the Association for Computing Machinery, ACM chapter, are also here to demo vintage computer reconstructions that have previously been exhibited at international computing festivals. Please join me in a round of applause for our fabulous students. It might surprise some of you that IBM 650 predates me, uh, although not by many years, uh, but I do have some fond memories. I was asked to try to remember my first use of computers, and the one that probably left the biggest impression on me was uh, my nerdiest memory of computing was uh, 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 using essentially an IBM machine, programming in PL1, running jobs on the IBM 370 mainframe, using JCL scripting language. Some of you in the room know what I'm talking about. Jim Morris certainly does. Uh, to instruct the operating system how to run a batch job. And uh, uh, as uh, Keith was mentioning, in the early days, at least when I learned to program, we used punch cards. And we often would submit our punch cards. And then we would come back about two hours later, three hours later, and get the output and find out that there was a missing semicolon. And then I tell our students they're so spoiled, they have no idea. Um, which I think made all of us uh, uh, much better programmers and developers because you had to be so, so careful about uh, what you did. I did want to share one side story with you. One time I was taking my second computer science course, and I remember it was a second data structures class, and I had like, I don't remember, maybe a 2,000 punch cards that I had typed in program ready to be submitted. I submitted it. Five hours later, I get the output back, and it just didn't seem like anything that I submitted. It just seemed like a uh, different language, as it turns out, all sorts of errors and so on. And I went to the, the, to the, to the uh, window and asked the guy who was submitting it to card readers, and I said, uh, d is this my set of cards that I submitted? He said, oh, yeah, it is. We dropped it, and then we put it all back together <laughs> and submitted it. So, you know, it was a time when uh, things happened much more slowly, I can tell you. But uh, there is a certain level of nostalgia uh, just thinking about these early machines again. As a computer scientist, 
I don't need to tell you that computers have been central to many of our careers in this room. I'm enormously proud, of course, to serve as a steward of this great institution uh, that helped pioneer art artificial intelligence, established the nation's first robotic institute, founded the first college in the world devoted solely to computer science, not to mention this first undergraduate AI program that we launched last year. Uh, our model, of course, is still a model that other universities follow, and the paradigm shifting advancement developed here have had an immeasurable impact on society. Over the past 50 years, we've been at the forefront of innovations in an increasingly information-driven society, but celebrating the computers, uh, campus's first computer is also a celebration of all that computation has made possible, not just in computer science, uh, this is actually a great campus to highlight that, but also across the university in all areas of science and engineering, in the arts and the humanities, in business, economics, social science, and so much more. Although she couldn't be here, as you heard from uh, Keith, uh, Pamela McCorder, uh, 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 I wanted to take a moment to express my gratitude to her. She and her late husband, computer science department head, Joseph Traub, collected a remarkable history of our work in machine learning, AI, and computer science that are now exhibited to, uh, here at CMU. We're grateful to them uh, for their con con contribution. I also want to acknowledge, take a moment to acknowledge the team in the university libraries, including Andrew uh, McGee, from whom you just heard, as well as the History of Science and Technology Committee at, at Carnegie Mellon, the, which is known as host at CMU. I think this is just such a terrific thing, and it's so uniquely CMU to have a group of essentially colleagues and students and postdocs who across campus come together to look, it's an interdisciplinary committee of course, to uncover, classify, and celebrate CMU's accomplishments. Uh, I look forward to of course uncovering more threads of this history in the coming years, but I'm primarily here to introduce our keynote speaker. I'm delighted to introduce Jim Morris, who is an emeritus professor of computer science has worn many, many hats at CMU, too many to enumerate. He has been a department head, a founding director of HCI, and of course from 1999 to 2004, he served as our dean of the School of uh, Computer Science. Jim's service to computer science and to Carnegie Mellon extends back to the 1980s when he first was first director of the Information Technology Center, ITC, <clears throat> a joint venture with IBM that actually conceived and led to university's original um, Andrew project. Aside from that, he set foot on campus. I, had, I found out, in fact, a few months ago as a native Pits Pittsburgher attending Spring Carnival. Uh, are you going to say this later or no? But I should say it then. 65 years ago plus. Uh, he would later enroll as an undergraduate and become a member of the varsity football team and serve as president of Delta Upsilon Fraternity. Yes, folks, Jim Morris was a frat boy at some time in the past. <laughs> uh, Jim spent his career shaping our strength in computer science together with trailblazers like Newell, Simon, Perlis, Haberman, Raj Reddy, and so many more. Today, Jim is, is of course, is our keynote speaker, and his presentation will discuss the legacy of these leaders that established for generations of CMU researchers to come. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Jim Morris. Jim, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, so the real beginning of the change at Carnegie Mellon wasn't in my mind in the 650, but in 1949 when Herb Simon came here. I came here to GSIA. That was uh, the real starting point for this remarkable transformation. Uh, but I came in 1959. In the, uh, so I think in the fall of 1960, I was having a beer at the fraternity house. And one of the brothers came in and said, taking a class from this crazy professor who said, whatever grade you would like, if you're in that rat race, just write the grade on the blue book in your exam, and I'll give you that grade in the course. I said, that sounds like a fascinating course. What is it? Uh, the other course was computer programming, and the professor was Alan Perlis. Uh, so I enrolled in this class, uh, uh, hoping to get my A. 
whatever, and uh, came, arrived in a huge room, Porter Hall 100, I think, 200 excited geeks ready to learn about programming, and the front of the room was perilous. And he was an extraordinary, it's the first time I'd seen him, an extraordinary looking fellow. He had, he had no hair, not even eyebrows at that point. Uh, but he was the most enthusiastic, dynamic person I had, uh, had seen in many, many years. Uh, and he was talking about programming, and, and for the first of many occasions, I didn't understand what he was talking about. Um, anyway, uh, he, would get, he would talk about whatever was perplexing or amusing him that day. Uh, it was very, very ad hoc sort of lectures, but he was telling us that programming was really an exciting thing to do. Uh, he, uh, he assigned whimsical problems. He said, design a program or write a program that designs motel layouts because apparently he'd stayed in a motel recently and he began to think about that. Uh, so that, that's the sort of guy he was. Uh, he, was the head of the, he was the head of the math department. He was the head of the computer center. Uh, as the head of the computer center, he did everything he could to get everybody programming. Until that time, uh, computers were really sort of sequestered in research labs, but Alan, who had been a student at Tech, said, I want everybody on this campus who is interested to learn how to program. Uh, he was, um, uh, uh, so anyway, he was quite active in computing. He was an international gadfly. He was on an international committee to design programming languages. He was the first editor of the Academic Journal of Computing. He was the first winner of the Turing Award, which is the uh, Nobel Prize of Computing. Uh, I said, if this doofus is a big cheese, there can't be that much competition. <laughs> I said, this, looks, this like a, looks like a good career choice for me, so I got out of physics or I had to worry about Einstein and Newton and all I had to do was compete with Perlis. Uh, so that, that sort of sealed my fate uh, and it worked out quite well for me. Uh, but then uh, as time went on, uh, in the 60s, a lot of money started to come from the Defense Department for Computing and Carnegie Mellon started its Computer Science Department and Perlis was the first uh, director or head of the department. Uh, and, and, and I think he also kept all these other jobs too, so you might wonder how he did it. Well, he did it by not really managing anything in a traditional sense. He wouldn't hold any meetings, he wouldn't do formal activities, no committees, he would just decide what to do as the decisions came along. Uh, but he did make great decisions. He hired people from all over the world who were enthusiastic in computing, regardless of credentials, because there really aren't, weren't any credentials in computer science, which wasn't even called that at the time. So it had people from all over the world that he'd met in his travels. Uh, he, uh, let's see, at the, at the beginning of a PhD program, some students were complaining about the curriculum, and he said, okay, go and design a curriculum and come back and tell me what you think and, and we'll talk about it. So they went away for two weeks or months, whatever it was, came back with a curriculum. And he said, this looks good, let's do it. And so that's how, in fact, a bunch of graduate students, beginning graduate students at Carnegie Mellon designed a computer science curriculum which has been copied all over the country because those students went on to teach at other places. Um, uh, Alan uh, Perlis uh, invented or promulgated the reasonable person principle, which basically goes like this. We can't have rules that explain everything to do, and if we had rules, all you computer nerds would figure out how to get around them. So all I want you to do is make a reasonable si decision in any situation, or if you think something's reasonable, do it, and we'll deal with the consequences later. And this reasonable person principle is still being talked about um, in computer science and around the world today. Uh, what else about Perlis? He, um, uh, oh, he, uh, he wrote many papers about programming languages and so forth, but his He's most well known, oh, there's a picture of Alan. Uh, he's best known for a huge number of epigrams that say things about computing which amuse computer people. Uh, one man's software, in software everything is possible but nothing is easy. One man's constant and another man's variable. <laughs> Fools ignore complexity, pragmatists suffer it, some can avoid it, geniuses remove it. There are two ways to write error-free programs. Only the third one works. <laughs> Alan, I found in general situations, tried to always say the least expected thing. Um, so, uh, let's see. Uh, 
so later on, by this, by this point, I was now teaching at Berkeley, but I was traveling in, in Europe, and I went to a computer conference in Bavaria being held by NATO. Uh, this computer conference was, uh, it became a sort of an annual affair in the summer. It was run by a, a, a German guy who happened to be in the Wehrmacht in World War II, the German army. So many, some people said, I'm not going to this thing run by a former Nazi soldier. And you would have think that Perlis, who was descended from Jews in Squirrel Hill, would be one of these. But Allen, true to form, plunged right in with great enthusiasm. He went to this thing multiple times. He brought his, his wife and his daughter. And my wife and I spent many happy hours uh, drinking beer and kibitzing with him uh, after the, in the evenings at this uh, summer school. The summer school also featured a sporadic debate between uh, Perlis and a guy named Dijkstra, who was a, a Dutch computer scientist. And they would give alternate lectures, and they were talking about computer things, but somehow they were also having a debate between each other, which they probably thought was about computer and computer science, but it's really about their philosophy of life. Allen was a liberal, open, very hopeful person who believed in the perfectibility of humans and for perfectibility of man. I actually think he said that one day at this conference. Uh, Dijkstra on the hand was a very pessimistic guy and, and sort of nasty and he believed that most things that were going on, especially in computer science, were wrong. Uh, the irony behind this is the way they look. Uh, Perlis could have passed for an extraterrestrial and, 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 and Dijkstra was sort of a fuzzy guy. So, uh, but Alan was the most human person I've ever met. So it was an interesting contrast. Uh, let's see. Uh, many years later, a couple or maybe five years later, I was working at Xerox Park, which was sort of inventing a new compar computer paradigm. And I had a callway conversation with my friends one day where I was just talking about what I thought of Perlis's contributions. And here's an approximation of what I said. Whereas most people in computer science at the time were practicing an academic discipline they already knew and using computers to leverage it, Perlis knew that this new thing called software, not hardware, was the most important thing. Uh, and he believed the most important thing to do was to get everybody to learn how to write software. And he specialized in programming languages was something that did that. So one day he said to a, an assembled group of experts, you're talking like mountaineers arguing about how fast you can climb Mount Everest. And what we have to do is transport thousands or maybe millions of people to hundreds of mountaintops around the world. So that's the kind of let's go for it sort of guy that he was. Uh, by, this, by this time, uh, Alan was beginning to fail in health. He had a, an autoimmune disease, which none of us really understand. And he was mostly confined to a wheelchair. But he was still as vibrant as ever. And, but he was now, he'd left CMU and started the computer science department at Yale. Uh, but he came back for the 10th anniversary and gave us all a pep talk about how to have fun in computing. And then sometime he, after that, he died. And at the 25th anniversary, we had a big celebration of the 25th anniversary of the computer science department, and we honored Allen by creating a chair in computer science in his name. Uh, so for the next 20 years, by this time I was on the faculty at CMU, for the next 20 years, as Farnham said, I've had innumerable administrative jobs, something that no self-respecting professor really ought to be doing. And I just thought, thinking about this recently, oh, I was doing this because I wanted to be like Perlis, this guy who I thought was a doofus in 1960. I was trying to be like him. Now, of course, I couldn't be like him, but I'm glad I did that to honor his contributions and, and the way he had lured me into this great career. Uh, OK, Alan Newell. Uh, Pamela McCordick has a great phrase in, in her early book about him, about artificial intelligence. She said, Alan was a big man with a pear-shaped face which was always radiating the obvious enthusiasm and excitement he had about his work. And that was Alan. That is so perfect that I just had to quote it directly. Uh, I took a graduate seminar from Alan, uh, I, th I think late in my undergraduate career. Uh, he, uh, he came into the room and started talking about a biology paper, even though he wasn't a biologist. And he said, I don't really understand this, but these are the equations that explain why your heart beats faster when you run. And he was sort of working his way through it to sort of show us the way you tried to understand something. I realized at the time, and, and certainly learned later, that he had tremendous courage about diving into any intellectual issue 
regardless of whether he knew anything about it. He was, he was certainly a polymath, and so he was willing to go to argue with anybody in any department on this campus. Um, so after his talk, he looked at a graduate student and said, I'd like you to give a paper next week. Are you willing to do that? This graduate student was a guy named David Parnas, who some of you might know. And the graduate student said, well, if you twist my arm. So Alan walked over, started twisting his arm, <laughs> and finally Parnas said, OK, I'll do it. So he was a spontaneous jokester. Uh, he, was, he started his career at uh, the Rand Corporation, where he worked on the SAGE system, which was an early warning system uh, that the US military was using. Uh, and he met many computer scientists there and, and other com computer types. And he met one named Oliver Selfridge, from whom he learned a new programming paradigm that Selfridge called pandemonium. I won't bother explaining that, but Newell said, that changed my life. I decided a new way in which I should pursue programming to do entirely different, arrange my programs entirely differently. And that's when he became a, an artificial intelligence expert, even though it wasn't called that at the time. He said, it changed my life that day. I went back and reprogrammed my whole system according to these principles, and he never looked back. He also met Herbert Simon, who was consulting for RAND at the time. And it was love at first sight, intellectual love at first sight. They formed a partnership that went on for 40 years to, to basically begin many fields, including artificial intelligence. Uh, the first thing they did, which is recorded on one of these charts here, is they created something called the logic theorist, which proved theorems in propositional logic. Now, propositional logic is, I'm like a, let me, here's something that is like propositional logic. Suppose three missionaries and three cannibals are on the shore, and they want to get to an island two miles away, and there's a boat that holds two people at a time, and the problem is that you can never allow the cannibals to uh, out be more cannibals than missionaries on either shore, because then the cannibals will kill them and eat them. So you have to figure out how to go back and forth with these boats to move people around, so that's true. So that's, that's the kind of intellectual problem proving something in propositional logic is. Uh, anyway, they uh, interviewed, or they had many people sit down and solve these problems because uh, a guy named Bertrand Russell, famous British philosopher, had written a bit book proving all these theorems in this logic, so it was regarded as a new, real intellectual feat. So they had people try to solve these problems, which many of them did, and they talked aloud while they were doing them, and they recorded their voices, and uh, then they put all that together, and they developed an algorithm which they thought was good for doing propositional logic. Now, computer time was precious at the time, so Newell and Simon got their wives and children to simulate a computer by passing cards between each other and doing all these mechanical steps, and they managed to prove some theorems from propositional logic that was in this book by Russell. Uh, they went, went ahead, and that, that worked. Simon announced that they had created a thinking machine in 1956, winter of 1956. They went on and programmed the thing, and then more or less did all the theorems in this large book uh, by, by Russell. Uh, so that, that, and that was the first concrete demonstration of a computer program which you could claim to be intelligent. Um, let me see. The other thing about that program that was interesting is Newell, Simon and Newell were cognitive psychologists, first and foremost. They were interested in describing how humans think. And they said to the cognitive psychology community, look, you don't have to be writing differential equations or writing prose paragraph to describe how people think. You can make a precise theory represented as a computer program, and then you can test that theory by running the computer programming and seeing if it does the same things that the humans were doing. So they really began to disrupt and energize the field of cognitive psychology along with beginning artificial intelligence, all with one project. Uh, so uh, do, 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 do. Uh, so Alan, Alan was the power behind the throne in the computer science department. He was never the department head, and he always let the department head make the decisions, but I think he met with department heads weekly, if not more often, and was constantly giving them advice and guiding them. And I think every student and everybody in the computer science department depended upon Alan's uh, good sense and example. So he did that for 30 or 40 years. Uh, the, um, uh, let's see. 
He also was also he was consulting at Xerox Park where I was working, and the entire computer community at that time was getting excited about the kind of system that was being built at Xerox Park, which was personal computers linked together with a network, namely the system that all of us use today. And though, but before that, it was all these mainframes like the 650. Anyway, Newell and the computer science department went to the president of the university and said, we want to build that kind of system for our campus. Uh, be, and we want to be the first, and we want to try this new paradigm and show how it works on a college campus. Uh, Cyrus went around and just raised money, and he got to, went to IBM and raised a kind of amazing $10 million a year project to build such a system. Uh, more or less by coincidence, I came to CMU on a sabbatical that year uh, in the fall of 82. And while I was here, Sired announced this computer for every student project, and everyone's very excited about it. Uh, and Alan Newell and a few people were trying to convince me that I should be here to direct that project. I was reluctant because, well, I, I had a conversation with Alan. I said, well, it would be sort of a taboo to uh, leave Xerox and go to work for a project funded by IBM and, and give them all that great knowledge that I acquired. And Alan said, Jim, here's, here's the thing. Uh, when you break a taboo, it's, it's really enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's sold me, and I've been, oh, I, you saw the chart, I've been here ever since. Uh, so in this, in this project, we had a big problem about what kind of computer to use. Should it be a Macintosh? Should it be an IBM PC? Arguments were flaring, and it was, I was in quite a quandary about which direction to go in, and I went to Alan to ask him for advice. And he said, he said look, Jim, the only thing that matters, actually, is the network infrastructure. Concentrate on that. And that's what we did, and it turns out that that's the only part of the Andrews system that still is in use today. Uh, and as you've noticed, the network infrastructure is like the permanent feature of our lives, and the device we use, whether it's a laptop or a phone or everything, is changing all the time. So that was just another example of the kind of way, sort of person he was. He would focus on your problem, not his problem. He would dive in, solve your problem, and then like my childhood hero, the Lone Ranger, would ride out of town and go and uh, back to his research. But he was a very important person. Uh, so he, um, he, uh, he promoted, he was the one who put through the very difficult political problem of creating the School of Computer Science, which if you know the academic world, you can imagine was a big deal. It took him a couple of years. He also said at the time that he wanted us to begin an effort in human-computer interaction, which was going to be an alliance between the computer science department and the psychology department. Everybody was enthusiastic about it, but, but actually nobody did anything about it. In fact, I went off and started a company doing the same sort of things that he was describing, the interaction between human computers and the interface. Um, then, so two or three years later, or two years later, I think, in 92, suddenly Allen came down with uh, prostate cancer, which was a devastating blow to many of us. Uh, I, I, well, I was talking to him on the phone that summer, and I said, you know, I sort of broke out, what, which was a purely professional relationship. I said, Alan, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that this is happening. And Alan said, well, you're not as sorry as I am. <laughs> it was most, that's, that was Alan. Uh, so anyway, uh, so when he, after he died, uh, I, and uh, Perlis had actually died a few years before that, once somebody remarked, and everybody had the feeling, the giants of computer science who have guided CMU have left us. And the, I thought, I and many people, I think, were wondering what was going to happen next. So I stopped working on my uh, startup company and came back and became a department head at CMU and tried to do the best I could to get things you at least tell people things are going to be okay. The first thing I did uh, was I wrote down what I called Alan Newell's precepts. And these were the things that I learned from him because I'd never actually seen him write it all down. So do what you love, love what you do. We've already said, he was so enthusiastic about his search for the, the, uh, how computers could think that he just loved doing that. He said, help others to do what they love. And that's a unique feature. Many people who begin to 
After you get your PhD, you begin to believe that the thing you're doing is the only thing that matters and nobody should work on anything else. But that was not, that was not Newell. He said, I'll help you do your thing uh, as much as you want me to. It was great. He said, don't worry about how smart you are. Uh, just get the work done and do the accomplishments. He really just cared about what the end result was, not how clever you were. Be intellectually tough. I uh, said that already. It's fine to take out time from research, but the, you should make it pay off in some way. You should make it tangible. Uh, when a technical agreement arises, stop arguing and devise an experiment to settle it. He, they sponsored many people, including Jeff Hinton, the recent winner of the Turing Award, to pursue approaches to artificial intelligence which they did not believe in. Newell and Simon said they invited Jeff Hinton and many other people to, to, to solve the problems. Uh, well, that's also about the research agenda. They invite people to solve the problems they were working on in different ways because they wanted the answer to emerge. They didn't insist upon being the ones who had the right answer. It was really an extraordinary tradition for them to start for the CS department. Uh, so the second thing I did was start this HCI effort uh, within the School of Computer Science, which it became the HCI Institute, which was a department. That's, that department is now 25 years old and has become the model for HCI departments across the country. Uh, okay, Herb Simon. Uh, in my senior year, I had a conversation with Herb Simon, which ended with him saying, young man, you have Charles River fever. The Charles River flows past Harvard and MIT. And I just told Simon I, that I was going to go to MIT. I wasn't going to become a graduate student in his new psychology department. Uh, now, Simon had uh, a kind of a resentment about Harvard and MIT and such places uh, for what he called their automatic presumption of greatness. He just, he just, he just didn't, well, he came to Carnegie Mellon, uh, the GSIA, with a lot of other brilliant people, who, and they remade business education. They started the field of analytic business, and they showed how you could do business using mathematics and computers. When other universities, richer universities, got wind of this, they began hiring away these guys, uh, some of which went on to win Nobel Prizes. Uh, Dick Liani and um, Jim March, uh, very big time people. They, they all, CMU got raided, uh, which often happens. But Simon never left. Now, in later years, you ask Simon why he never left, uh, because he certainly was offered jobs all over the place. He said, well, when I was in the University of Chicago, there was a football player there who became an All-American, uh, even though the football team didn't win a single game that year. He said, I want to be able to have everybody know that when I accomplished things, it wasn't because I was leaning on my institution, that it was something that I did, and my fame will be that much greater. And he said, I want to win the academic game that way. Now, he was very serious. He looked upon the academic game, so to speak, as, as a real competition. And he had lots of good advice about it. His, one of his best lectures was called How to Be Creative. Or it really might have been called How to Make People Think You're Creative. It said, um, he said first of all, he said, you choose a problem for which you have a secret weapon. He said, you should work on important problems. And if you're working on important problems, there are lots of other smart people working on these problems. So if you want to win, to be the first one to solve that problem, you better have some technique or technology which will uh, be that they don't have that you can use to beat them. So Simon, for example, was an excellent mathematician, but he applied it all to social science where there was very little mathematics going on. The second thing he said, which was, uh, uh, coherent with Carnegie Mellon's motto. He said you had to work hard. He said you have to work for 10 years to become world class at anything. Uh, he said you don't, you do, and he pointed out that Bobby Fischer, uh, before he was 14 years old, had played more games of chess than anybody ever had, including all the grand masters that ever existed. So it was all about the practice. He's sort of like the guy in the joke. Uh, you're driving through Manhattan and you ask, how do I get to Carnegie Mellon? And the guy on the corner says, practice. That was, that was, that was Simon's uh, attitude. And it's certainly a Carnegie Mellon attitude. Uh, now, the other thing he did to become famous was he got into fights and feuds everywhere. If you ever suggested in any venue, in writing or speaking, that there was something that a people could do that a computer couldn't do, Simon would be after you with hammer and tongs. It was, it was really uh, quite terrible. 
Uh, he, just, he just wouldn't, wouldn't stand for it. And this, of course, as we've learned recently with cable news and such, getting into fights, you can, you can give a wonderful description of the way the world is, and if nobody disagrees with you, everybody will forget it the next day. You've got to fight about things. So he actually, he fought with the neo-economists neo in GSIA. These are the guys who try to use mathematics and use the assumption that people can optimize their choices. Uh, Simon said, that's nonsense. Humans can't optimize their choices. They don't have enough intelligence or enough time. Uh, they just make decisions and with the, given the time allowed and do it. So he invented, I think he invented the term satisficing. He said, you just have to solve problems as they go along. And that's certainly, uh, that's become common knowledge. In fact, Daniel Kahneman, who won a Nobel Prize five years ago, uh, it's, Basically, he and his colleague Tversky did a lot of just proving how irrational and how quick, how the way people make decisions, which is far from optimal. Um, let me see. Uh, the, uh, so, he, uh, so he continued this combativeness. He and Newell took their results from the logic theorist to a conference of all the AI people in the country in 1957, right after they had written this computer program, and they were all impressed by it. But nevertheless, Simon got in, basically got into a fight with the other gurus of uh, artificial intelligence about how significant it was. And he more or less said, look, you guys have lots of ideas about how intelligence might work and lots of bright things, and you're all very smart people. But Alan and I were the only ones that have ever have produced a concrete example of an intelligent program. So go back to your labs and do something for a change. So that, that was uh, Herb's attitude. Uh, so he had some foibles. He, uh, he said that, um, he, said, he claimed that he never read newspapers or magazines because his friends at CMU would tell him if anything, anything happened that was important because they were watching television and reading magazines. He didn't need to bother. He said, well, maybe at the end of the year, I'll go and get the Encyclopedia World Book of 1972 and read it to see whether anything interesting has happened. But other than that, I don't, I don't waste my time doing that sort of thing. Uh, he, uh, at the eulogy for Alan Newell, or the memorial service for Alan Newell, and Herb got up to give his eulogy, uh, he said, well, Alan and I believe in doing good science. So what I think I'm going to do to, today is describe the latest theory which Alan and I were working on when he died. And then he went on to this 20-minute thing, which was what was supposed to be a, a eulogy. And I've actually seen that happen again at eulogies. John and Reynolds, uh, who, a colleague who died several years ago, Somebody else got up and gave a 20-minute lecture about, about actually his own work, not even John's. <laughs> uh, uh, we were once at, at Raj Reddy's house. We were once at a, a large faculty gathering of husbands and wives, and uh, uh, one of the faculty, a wife of a faculty member, made an off, offhand comment about the political situation with Herb, which Herb didn't think was correct. So down from the, his end of the table, he delivered a three-minute lecture proving to everybody at the table why what she said was completely wrong. Well, you know, the poor woman wanted to climb under the table, but, but Herb just, well, Herb was all business, uh, the business of, of science, if you will. Uh, let's see. Uh, so he's had a huge impact. A, a journalist wrote a book about Carnegie Mellon at the time, or in the 80s, that said, um, said, I think there should be a statue of Herb Simon in front of the Carnegie Music Hall, along with the statues of Shakespeare, Michelangelo, Galileo, and Bach. In the middle of the 1980s, I thought this was a little bit over the top. But now I'm beginning to think he might be that person. Uh, or he might, he might, if this artificial intelligence thing continues to be the huge thing that we think it is, I mean, artificial intelligence has gone from being science fiction to being a joke, to being sort of successful, to being a threat to all mankind. Uh, so if this is the century of artificial intelligence, uh, Simon is likely to be regarded as his father. Uh, so there's some irony in this, because especially with AI threatening the existence of humankind, uh, Simon and Newell were uh, uh, social scientists, which you think would be, want to improve the human condition. They wanted to prove that a computer could do anything that a person would do. They never thought about this question of, is this really a good idea? They, they never had what I would call an Oppenheimer moment. In fact, saying, oh, I don't know whether this will be good for uh, my friends. Uh, actually, Pamela McCordick asked uh, Newell for one, in one of her books, uh, why don't you write a, an article to explain to people what you're doing to 
you know, laymen, and, and Newell said, oh, if we did that, they would be scared stiff. Uh, Simon, Simon, I wish Simon were here to explain to us what we should do next, uh, but he's not. But he did, he did write a paragraph about uh, what he thought the situation was. And, it's, and this has been quoted in many places in many books. The definition of man's uniqueness has always formed the kernel of his cons cosmological and ethical systems. With Copernicus and, Gallico and, and Galileo, he ceased to be the species located at the center of universe attended by sun and stars. With Darwin, he ceased to, ceased to be the species created by God. With Freud, he ceased to be the species who, whose behavior was governable by rational mind. As we begin to produce mechanisms that think and learn, he has ceased to be the species capable of complex, intelligent manipulation of his environment. I am confident that man will, as he has in the past, find new ways of describing his place in the universe, a way that will satisfy his needs for dignity and purpose. But it will be as a, a way as different from the present one as the Copernican and the Ptolemaic. So he said, not my problem. <laughs> you guys figure it out, and that's something we need to do. Uh, one final comment about these. So that's Herb Simon. One final comment about that is important. These three people worked together as a team for many years. Um, let me go back to the very beginning here. They, yeah. They coincided for a long period of time. They never had any serious disputes. They had disagreements. They were very different people. Uh, but they always managed to work out their disagreements. Uh, and you know that in a great university, uh, the faculty, well, if you're, if you're in the faculty at MIT, you've proved you're the, one of the smartest people in the world. Now the only question is, is are you the smartest person in the world? You start fighting with the other smart people. Well, these guys were at Carnegie Mellon. They weren't worried about that. They were worried about accomplishing something. So they sort of set the spirit for computer science and many other people. And they created this great field of computer science for both Carnegie Mellon and the world. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. My final act before I go to be doused, I thought the rain might call it off, but. I'm going to get wet anyway, is to introduce Professor Lenore Bloom, who is going to offer some reflections. A little while back, we were sitting at a meeting in one of the Posner boardrooms, and Lenore said, I can kind of remember where that 650 was located, in the building next door to where we are seated today. And I just thought it would be fantastic to have some reflections from Lenore. So I'm going to invite her to say a few words. I'm going to go and get wet. Come and see me once we're finished. And Andrew Mead McGee will wrap up proceedings in a few months. Lenore, thank you. Well, thanks, Jim, for that wonderful um, history of Carnegie Mellon, why we're so excited to be in the Computer Science School of Computer Science. And also, thank you, Jim, for bringing me back to Carnegie Mellon. Um, so I'm going to also talk about this. Um, I'm a contemporary of Jim's. Actually, and we were in the same class, though I didn't know it then. And I'm going to talk about the same part, period of time early on, but perhaps from a slightly different perspective. And a couple of months ago, I wrote a little short story um, that was published in the Pittsburgh Quarterly Online. And um, I had titled it first, uh, Alan Perlis and Me. Um, and uh, Andrew had suggested Girl on the Move. So they picked up Girl on the Move, but actually it was out. So, well, you can say which, which title you prefer. So, um, and so it is from a girl's perspective of computing here at Carnegie Tech. So I arrived at Carnegie Institute of Technology, Carnegie Tech, in the fall of 1950. So I'm only going to read a few excerpts from this article, so I won't go on the whole thing. But OK, I arrived at, the, at Carnegie Institute of Technology, Carnegie Tech, in the fall of 1959 as a 16-year-old first-year student in the architecture department in the College of Fine Arts. I had chosen architecture because I loved art and math ever since I was a kid, and architecture seemed to be the perfect combination. I loved the ambiance of the architecture community at Tech. We all had drafting board space on long wooden tables in the huge bright room on the top floor of the Fine Arts building. The first few lines of tables were for first-year students, the next few for second, and so forth. 
Like most fine arts students, we worked on projects throughout the night, thus getting to know our classmates well. The upper division students would drop by our first year drafting tables with encouragement and helpful advice. Another advantage of having to work through the night was that I did not have to the, restrict, the restrictive dorm sign-in hours at the time, 8 p.m., I believe, that women outside of fine arts had. Presumably, to more easily manage us, all fine arts women were housed separately in the old Mellon Mansion on top of a hill on Forbes Avenue, near where the Cohen University Center stands today. I don't know if, do you remember that, Jim, where we were? Many of the architecture students came from families in the construction or architecture businesses. They had worked summer jobs in the field and were passionate. They had, they had been inspired by Anne Rand's The Fountainhead. One classmate had even spent a summer at Taliesin West, Frank Lloyd Wright's winter home and school in the Arizona desert. They were passionate. But for me, except for a wonderful world history course that included weekly lectures on the arts with a focus on Asian arts, the technical courses were not what I was looking for. The math and engineering were useful, but formulaic. I wanted to know why, not just how. So mid-second year, I decided to switch either to art or to math. I thought, math, I, thought I would be able to do the art on my own, which was a bit naive. But I certainly couldn't do math on my own. So switching to math seemed to me the right decision but not to everyone, as I would soon find out. Um, math at Carnegie Tech was in the College of Engineering and Science. Switching between colleges was not easy, particularly not from fine arts to engineering. Even today, that would be difficult. Carnegie Mellon University today, as Carnegie Tech then, generally accepts entering students into specific majors, and I was a fine arts girl. During my sophomore year, I spoke to deans and knocked on many doors. I was told time after time it was impossible to switch majors. Maybe I should think of seeing, seeking a counselor. Um, okay, But that did not stop me. One day I knocked on a math professor's door and as usual said I wanted to take math courses and become a math major. To my surprise, he immediately responded. Great, I'm teaching an experimental math course using the computer in IBM 650 in the basement of GSIA. That's the Graduate School of Industrial Administration. You can take my class. The computer will grade all your makeup homework. So I came in the middle of class. The math professor was Alan Perlis, and that's how I became a math major at Carnegie Tech. Perlis's course, and this is a little bit what Jim said, Perlis's course was not exactly the former mathematics I was looking for, but it was quirky, forward-looking, and definitely experimental. He was lively, enthusiastic, iconoclastic teacher, prancing around the classroom in sneakers, a striking figure with bald head and lashless piercing eyes, and you saw his picture. The arch-typical Hollywood computer genius. He would give us problems to solve that were all over the place, sometimes from numerical analysis, sometimes vaguely stated. Again, iterating, but uh, reiterating what Jim said. He occasionally gave us problems that had no known solution at the time, although we were not told that. For example, the firing squad problem. The firing squad problem is now standard in all automata theory courses, and for historical and cultural reasons, I often assign it for homework when I teach automata theory to undergraduate computer science students at Carnegie Mellon, although the solution is now readily available on the web. We had to solve our problems by writing programs in Perlis's programming language, TAS, in which instructions had to be written on paper line by line, each line that had to be coded into a computer punch card, and you heard that from Farnham and Jim, in the, and um, the resulting stack of cards had to be taken down to the computer room in the basement of GSIA. God forbid, as happened to Farnham, um, if you trip going down the stairs, and that didn't happen to you, but uh, your colleagues there. If you were lucky, next morning you would get reams and reams of paper showing how your program ran on the computer and the solution. If you were not lucky, well, then you had to figure out if there were a bug in your program or in punching of the cards. Right, and I see lots of nodding here. The acronym TAS 
which stood for tech assembly system, was pure perilous. In Congress, the House Un-American Activities Committee, HUAC, set up to ferret out communists um, in the early 50s was still active. And TASS was the name of the official Soviet news agency. <laughs> Perlis's view of the universal relevance of computing across disciplines was prescient, even startling at the time. His experimental course led to a formal programming course he instituted at Carnegie Tech the following year. And I want to say, many years later, um, somebody sent me an article that it was based on a conference in 63, 64 at MIT of Perlis talking about this course and what he said that we took. And he said, you know, engineers really need to do programming their first year. But liberal arts students, we can wait till their sophomore year. <laughs> but that was fun. It was in, this, in his experimental class that I became aware of another archetype the guy who spends day and night in the computer room writing and punching out computer programs. These early hackers or computer geeks, like Bill Gates and Paul Allen, were a more benign character than the computer hackers of today. Because Perlis accepted me into his class, I was able to enroll in other math classes. I loved the challenge of the course on modern math, which I called the brick wall course. If you made it through, you were on your way. This was Professor Moore, and I think Jim was also in that class. But I was shocked by the new ambiance. No one seemed to talk to one another. I had lost the camaraderie I had experienced in architecture. I was on my own. I'm skipping a whole bot bunch here now. I'm not exactly sure when I was officially declared a math major, but in the June of 1961, I received a letter from the assistant dean of the College of Engineering. Dear Miss Epstein, that was my maiden name, your final grades for the spring 1961 semester again indicate excellent scholastic performance. It is therefore a great pleasure for me to close 6061 academic year with this letter congratulating you, your parents, and your high school teachers on this very fine record. So I was in. The letter was sent on June 27, 1961, airmailed to our address in Caracas, Venezuela, with a four cent stamp. I actually had that letter. <laughs> Apparently, the US Post Office returned it for an additional four cents, and it was mailed the next day. So I was there. So basically, uh, that's my story. There's a lot more, and, and I'm happy to share this with you. It, it's online. Um, and maybe just a little addendum uh, here. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, so this is the article that uh, I mentioned before. Perlis' experimental course led to the formal programming course he instituted at Carnegie Tech the following year. In the Computer in the, in the University, Chapter 5 of Computers and the World of the Future, MIT Press, 1964, Perlis describes what he viewed as essential components of his course. He also prevents his view, prescient at the time, about the ubiquity of programming. And, and that's what I think was really uh, really prescient and really part of Carnegie Mellon that this is going to be a universal tool which as AI is going to be just knowing uh, having computer literacy is really a critical part of our, our, our world today and in fact that's what he, he actually says like physics and chemistry are important and literature is important and in a, in a liberal arts uh, course certainly by the so sophomore year everybody should be taking programming so thank you. Thank you to Professors Morris and Bloom from taking us to the local, from the local to the universal. And now, going in reverse from the present to the past, we hope to unveil, with the help of President Jahanian and Professors Bloom and Morris, a plaque to be installed next door in the basement of Posner Hall at the site of CMU's first electronic digital computer. I ask the three of you to come up. <laughs> This is the first and hopefully a growing series of plaques sponsored by the University Libraries promoting the institutional history of CMU. These youngsters here. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so how do we do this? Just pull off the cloth. Oh my gosh. All right. Well, uh, Lenore, help me out. And Jim, here we go.
In case you're wondering, it reads, the first computer on this site on August 28, 1956, the Carnegie Institute of Technology installed its first electronic digital computer, an IBM 650 mainframe. Sponsored by the Graduate School of Industrial Administration, the University Computation Center became the interdisciplinary hub for emerging campus interest in computers and information technologies. The computer remade Carnegie Mellon, and in return, Carnegie Mellon continues to remake the computer age. Thank you for coming. Please enjoy the reception.